All right, lesson 5.2 talks about the perpendicular bisector theorem and its converse. Okay, remember converse, we switch the order around. Okay, so we're going to do that again with the theorem. Converses don't always work. This is one of those times where it does, though. Remember, the other thing you need to do for lesson 5.2, you probably already watched it somewhere along the way, but it is the compass work for perpendicular bisectors. All three perpendicular bisectors meet at a point called the circumcenter. And then there were some things you need to know about the circumcenter. So that goes along with this. And the reason those certain things are true about the circumcenter comes from this theorem right here. So we're going to talk about this theorem. I'm actually going to prove that this theorem works. Okay, so we're going to take a look at this. CD is the perpendicular bisector of segment AB. That would be a given. Okay, it's marked up in the picture. So that's a given. So I'm going to start with my proof. I've got statements. We've got reasons. Okay, so statement number one is that CD is the perpendicular bisector of AB, and that's my given. Okay, now remember if you haven't copied this down, all right, make sure you always pause the video and copy it down so you don't get way behind. All right, let's start writing some stuff. So AD is congruent to DB. We already, we know that, it's marked already. The reason, though, comes from this word right here. Bisect means to do what? It means to cut in half. So definition of a bisector. It's already marked, but I'm going to put an S for side. Okay, I have one side of my triangle. Now, is there a second side that would be pretty easy to get? Is there a side in this triangle and a side in this triangle that's really easy to say they're congruent? Hopefully you can figure that out. We just do this right here, right? CD is congruent to what? itself. Why is something always congruent to itself? Which property is that? It's your reflexive property of congruence. I already marked it in my picture. I'm going to put an S for side right here. Okay. Now, what do we know about this angle? Angle CDB. I've already got a little box there. Remember, it got perpendicular. But what do I know about angle CDA? I know both of those angles have to be what kind of angles? Well, angle CDA and angle CDB are right angles. Now that is not the definition of perpendicular though. Some of you always get that confused. Our definition of perpendicular says there's one right angle. There's a theorem though that says perpendicular lines form four right angles. I only named two of them, okay? That's fine. I'm going to go ahead and put a little, little box over here so I see it's in both of them. Now, what do we know about those angles? If they're both right angles, then they have to be what? they got to be congruent to each other. Angle CDA is congruent to angle CDB. All right angles have to be congruent to each other. I remember the name of that theorem? Right angle congruence theorem. And since I named the congruent angles, I'm going to put an A for angle right there. Now, side-side angle, that's one we don't like. Okay, remember the side-side angle doesn't work. Now, it does work if the angle is a right angle, and it is, so we might call it HL, but let's look at this. Do we really have HL here? Do I have the hypotenuse? Oh, the hypotenuse is way over here. I don't have any marks on the hypotenuse. So look at the order here. What have I got? Side, angle, side. So my triangles are congruent. So triangle CDA is congruent. Now I've got to match the order. I went CDA, top, down to the middle, and out to the side. So I'll go top, down to the middle, out to the side, CDB. And we just said it's side angle side. Congruence postulate. Now we're almost done. We've got one more step. What's something we often use right after we prove triangles are congruent? You guys remember that? Should hopefully remember that from chapter for CPCTC, right? What does it stand for? You can say it out loud at home, that's fine. Corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. So, well, what, what part do I want? Well, I could say angle A is congruent to angle B. I could say this angle C, ACD, is congruent to that angle C, BCD. Or I could say this side, AC, is congruent to this side, BC. Any of them are fine. The one we want is the side. So AC is congruent to BC. Now what in the world did we just prove? 
we proved the perpendicular bisector theorem. Okay? We just went through the whole proof. We proved that this theorem is going to work. Let's take a look at what it says. If a point, up here that's point C, okay? What point? Point C. Lies on the perpendicular bisector, CD, of a segment, AB, then the point, point C, is equidistant. What does equidistant mean? Same distance. Equal distances. Equidistant. Equidistant to the two endpoints of the segment, this segment. Well, what are the endpoints? A and B. So C is the same distance to A, right there, AC, as C is to B, BC. C is the same distance to A as it is to B. That's it, we're done. That's what the theorem says. So if a point, in this case point C, is on the perpendicular bisector of a segment, then it's the same distance to the endpoints. Now I could put another point right here, let's call it E. And EA and EB would be the same distance. Any point anywhere along this perpendicular bisector is the same distance to A as it is to B. If it's up here, point F, FA, FB, got to be congruent. Anywhere along this segment. Measure the distance to A, measure the distance to B, they're going to be the same. Basically what we'll do, we'll often turn this into an algebra problem. So we'll give you a picture like this with the perpendicular and the bisector, and we'll put you know 5x plus 3 and 3x minus 7. 5x plus 3 equals 3x minus 7, solve. Okay, nothing complicated, all right, just set them equal to each other and solve. All right, now let's take a look at the converse of this theorem. Now you notice converse, something's missing. Converse where we switch the order, right? So the other one said, if a point is on the perpendicular bisector of a segment, you notice I don't have a perpendicular bisector, then that point is equidistant to the endpoints. Well, I already have the equidistant to the endpoints. Okay, so that's the difference. We just switch the order up. Okay, so let's go statements, reasons. Now the first statement I can make is the given. XW is congruent to XY. And that's a side. Now, you might say, well, what do you mean it's a side? I only have one triangle. You're right, we need two triangles. So how do I get two triangles? Well. I know that I can draw a segment wherever I want to. Okay, I can draw from X straight down to here somewhere. Call it point Z or whatever. There's a postulate. Remember, there's a postulate that said if I have a segment or a line, and I have a point not on that line, there's exactly one line that goes from here down to here and meets it perpendicularly. So I, I know it exists. I'm going to go ahead and draw it. Now, I could use a compass to get it precise, but I'm just going to draw it in by freehand. And I know it's got to be perpendicular down here somewhere. And I'm just going to say, well, that somewhere is point Z. And I know it exists. That's what that postulate tells me. All right, so let's write that down. XZ is perpendicular to WY. Well, how do I know that happens? That postulate's name was called the perpendicular postulate. Yeah, that's one of those names you might not remember because we don't use it very often, but you definitely should remember the, the postulate. If there's a line and a point not on that line, there's exactly one line through this point that's perpendicular to this one down here. Now, I don't put A or for angle or anything like that because I haven't said anything's congruent. But just like the proof we just did, we're going to name some angles. Angle X, ZW, the one out here to the left, and XZY, this one right here off to the right side, have to be what kind of angles? They have to be right angles. Remember there's that theorem again that says perpendicular lines form four right angles. I only named two of them, but that's okay. All right, let me put this little box in here. Now we could say these angles are congruent. We technically don't have to, but a lot of times we're just getting that habit, so I'm gonna go ahead and say they're congruent. X, Z, W is congruent to X, Z, Y. Right angle congruence theorem. 
and I'm going to put an A for angle. I already have them marked in my picture. Okay, what's something else that's congruent from this triangle over here over to that triangle over there? Just like the prior proof, that line right down the middle has got to be congruent to itself, right? XZ is congruent to XZ. Reflexive property of congruence. I'm going to abbreviate a little bit this time. All right, I'm going to put an S for side. Now, it looks like here I have side angle side, which works, but let's check up here. Is it side angle side? The angle would have to be between the two sides. It's not. So what is it? It's side side angle. We usually don't like side side angle unless the angle is a right angle. In which case we rename it, who remembers, HL. Now this is why you didn't technically need to say these are congruent. Because as long as I have the two sides congruent and the right angle, it's HL. You don't technically have to say the angles are congruent. But if you do, great, no problem. A lot of us get in that habit of naming them as congruent, that's fine. All right? But technically, as long as you say I've got two congruent sides, this is the hypotenuse, this is a leg, and I have right angles, that's what the HL congruence theorem says. All right, but what do we have to say? We have to say the triangles are congruent, right? Okay, so triangle, let's name this one over here. I'm going to go with WXZ. So I want you to think real quick about how you'd name the other one. you got to follow that order. So I went WXZ, so you have to do YXZ. All right, what do we use right after congruent triangles again, you guys remember? Well, CPCTC. Now, i got lots of options. I could say that angle there is congruent to that angle there. That's not what I'm going to say. I could say angle W is congruent to angle Y. I'm not really going to do that either. Or I could say WZ is congruent to ZY. That's what I'm going to say. WZ is congruent to ZY. Well, Why did you pick that, Mr. Oates? Why not the angles? Well, because that's not what the converse theorem says. All right? Not quite done. we got one more step to go. All right, so if this right here is congruent to that right there, and I know it's already perpendicular, then XZ is the perpendicular, if it makes two congruent things, what word would I use? XZ is the perpendicular bisector of WY. Well, how do I know that? Well, it's perpendicular. And right here I said I cut it in half, so that's just the definition of a perpendicular bisector. It's perpendicular, yep, and it cut it in half. It formed right angles and it cut it in half. Definition of a perpendicular bisector. All right, kind of a long proof. So let's look at what it says. Perpendicular bisector converse theorem. Remember, switching the order around. I'm going to go back to the other order real quick here. If a point is on the perpendicular bisector, then it's equidistant to the endpoints. Look at how this one reads. If a point is equidistant to the endpoints, then it's on the perpendicular bisector. Let's, let's talk about those. So X is that point right there. A point, in this case it's X, is equidistant, same distance to the two endpoints. Those were W and Y. Then that point, X, is on the perpendicular bisector. XZ is the perpendicular bisector. Of the segment, which segment? WY. There we go. So if we started off, once again, we can do algebra with this type of thing. So if I started off by some, doing something like this, okay, and I tell you these are congruent, then what I know is that there, there's um, a segment here. This is going to be on the perpendicular bisector. Okay, so if I call this, you know, A, B, C, and D. Okay, A has to be on the perpendicular bisector. So if they tell you this is perpendicular, then you know it's a bisector. Or if they tell you it's a bisector, you know it's perpendicular. You can kind of go either direction. So I could set up some algebra where these are equal, or maybe some algebra where this has to equal 90. Okay, so that's the converse theorem. Okay, we don't use this one quite as much as we use this one, though. So make sure you understand both, though. Just understand the difference in the order. Okay, all we're doing is switching it around. But definitely make sure you can do this one and apply some algebra to this. Okay? So if you see something like this, okay, where you're told a point is on the perpendicular bisector, so J, K, L, M, 
and this is congruent, so perpendicular bisector, then we know JK is congruent to KL. And let's say it's 5x plus 3, and over here 3x plus 7. Real quick, your algebra just says, hey, I know they're congruent, so 5x plus 3 has to equal 3x plus 7. Subtract the 3x, cancel, 2x plus 3 equals 7. Subtract the 3, cancel, 2x equals 4. We're running out of room down here, but we're going to divide by 2 and get x equals 2. Check your answer. 5 times 2 is 10. 10 plus 3 is 13. 3 times 2 is 6. 6 plus 7 is 13. It makes sense. Okay, it makes sense. All right, that's it for lesson 5.2. Remember, watch the compass work as well for perpendicular bisectors, which meet at a point called the circumcenter as well. That's part of lesson 5.2 as well. All right, that's it for this video.